Hi, and welcome to our next section here in our chapter on Bayesian optimization. So here we'll introduce the basic template Bayesian optimization loop and um, yeah, mainly talk about the fundamental idea of using a surrogate model. So this means we have our expensive black box function in front of us. We can only place some points, we can evaluate that. And now I guess the fundamental idea is if we want to kind of maximize information extraction and maximize exploiting all of the knowledge we can like squeeze out of these uh, few variations. How about we try to learn the relationship between the inputs and the outputs? So we have a couple of inputs. We have one numerical output that sounds a lot like regression, right? And as we are machine learners, we know how to do regression. We know how to do nonlinear regression. And this is exactly what we will do. We'll uh, learn a model based on our so far um, observed data points and placed experiments and of course their results, um, then fit a regression model um, to them and optimize this regression model instead or in place of our original expensive black box function because optimizing that surrogate model is cheap. Okay, And we'll now here um, talk a little bit about how we initialize that Bayesian optimization loop. This is sometimes calling creating an initial design. What we mean by this surrogate modeling, I guess I've already explained that, 90% of it. Um, yeah, how the basic loop then runs and iterates and uh, at the end we will also discuss what ingredients are missing and that's basically the ingredient of the acquisition function and that if we kind of follow this naive approach if as I, I'm going to outline it here in this section uh, we're going to miss out a lot on exploration during our Bayesian optimization. So um, okay so what was our scenario again? Our scenario was we have our objective function f. Uh, we can only evaluate it. We do not know its functional form. Um, we can't really compute gradients on it. It's basically very often it's a computer program where we can define some inputs, wait some time, and then observe the numerical outcome. Um, for now, I will assume that those evaluations are noise-free. Later on, we will talk about how to also deal with um, noisy problems. For now, they are noise-free. Um, in some scenarios, they are. In some, they are not. Um, now, the idea is to use our data that we have seen until now. So again, I will use for iterations, uh, because this will be an iterative procedure. I mean, the data we are observing comes from us defining design points, defining experiments. Um, so the inputs, kind of as normal in my normal machine learning notation here, I will denote with a vector x, and the outcome I will denote with a uh, non-bold y. So this is how our usual regression data looks like, and I've already used superscripts with uh, round braces in, in machine learning notation. As I'm here more talking about iterations, I guess I will use these um, these um, um, yeah. Uh, these, these brackets here instead, okay, a superscript. So dt is the data we have seen until and including iteration t, okay? And these outcomes here, uh, they are simply f, our unknown black box function, our unknown computer program applied to the ith input vector. And the idea now is to kind of yeah, look at the data and extract as much information as it from it as possible and our tool for that will be fitting a nonlinear regression model to that data. So before we can do this we have to start somewhere so we have to place some points into our input space so we can then learn from their results. Um, so the idea is to cover and explore the input space as evenly um, and as best as possible. There are a couple of ways of doing that simply doing some form of a random design just like uniformly uh, randomly sampling some points um, using something that's called Latin hypercube sampling or using Sobol sequences. Um, usually, I mean, there are people really studying the effects of these designs and the pros and cons, but from my experience, the type of the design usually has not the largest effect. Um, I will discuss a bit what you can do with uh, Latin hypercube sampling or how this is how this is defined and what the idea behind this is to kind of kind of really maximize on that uniformity and maximize distances between um, all of your experiments so you kind of have explored as uniformly as possible 
Usually what's a bit more important is the choice of the design. That's actually pretty hard to get right. In practice, there are not there are a lot of rules of thumb out there, but not a lot of theoretical guarantees. And yeah, depending on your scenario, you sometimes have to fiddle a little bit around with that, depending on domain knowledge. The idea is that you want to invest as much into your initial design as you need to be able to fit your first regression model on that without it being totally um, degraded, um, yeah, totally rubbish, and then in turn misleading your subsequent iterations and optimization but of course you also don't want to invest too much budget into this because using this initial design doesn't learn anything right so every 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 like computational unit every you know, function evaluation you spend there you do this in a non-sequential manner so one rule of thumb is to have that roughly linearly depend on d so maybe use 2d maybe use 4d maybe use 10d that depends a bit on your budget on the dimensionality of the search space and on the and difficulty of your problem i guess um so what we often use and what we often recommend is doing something like 4 to the d that usually is enough to fit your first model um and it's usually um lightweight enough uh, to ensure that you have enough budget left for sequential iterations now, how does Latin hypercube sampling work? So there's, in a certain sense, there are two stages of this or two, uh, well, I guess, two parts. Um, the first one is kind of the true Latin hyper, hyper, um, um, hypercube part. So that partitions the search space into uh, bins of equal probability or an equal size. So you can see them here. We've created these bins in our two-dimensional input space. And now the idea is to distribute the points so in each row and in each column you are covering only one of these bins okay and um, which means um yeah and i should actually point at this here because this is the lhs example and that's the random design example okay where we just place points randomly so for for lhs um if you look into these bins and into the rows and columns, uh, you can see that for this, for this column here, well, there's only one point in there. And for that column, there's only one point in there. For that column, there's only one point in there and so on. Um, now, if you look into rows, I guess I'm not going to do this again for everyone, but here's only one, here's only one, there's only one. That's fine, yeah? And the result of that is if you look now at the marginal distributions, yeah? So, I mean, in... In expectation, yeah, your marginal distribution here, or let's say theoretically, yeah, looking at the your sampling distribution, the true marginal distribution will be uniform for random design and for LHS. But for a concrete sample, if you look at the histogram here, for random design there will be some variation. Well, for LHS, this will be completely uniform, yeah, because of having having exactly one point um, per cell. Um, or having having exactly one set covered per row and per column okay so this kind of evens it out even further now there are many of these um latin hypercube plans that follow this principle yeah so having one point or having one covered cell per row and column now if you look and look at this there are still some points which are pretty close together and one might dislike that and one anyway i guess could strive for a principle to kind of define what we mean with an optimal LHS plan. And there are various ways of doing that. One thing that is potentially quite intuitive is saying, hey, I dislike if points are close together. So we might look at this minimum distance between two plot points in a valid, L valid LHS plan, okay? Usual measure that by Euclidean distance, but we can use any form of metric. Now, what we can do is we can simply say, I want to use that LHS plan that maximizes this minimum dif distance between two points. So this looks for plans um, for LHS designs here where this distance here, for example, becomes um, as large as possible. Yeah? So we basically, we look at the two nearest neighbors in the plan and we measure the distance and that's kind of our cost function and we try to maximize that. Okay, and that's a so-called maximum design uh, for LHS. Now, um, this is for the initialization. As I said, the initialization, well, we have to talk about it. We have to start somewhere.
but this is not the most interesting part of um, Bayesian optimization. The most interesting part is actually the surrogate modeling and that how we optimize our surrogate model to define our next um, proposed point, our newly defined experiment. So as a running example, I will now minimize this <laughs> quote unquote black box function, which is just this one, one D test function here. Okay. So this might be a little bit, I don't know, underwhelming and also in a certain sense hides some complexity um, for tougher real world problems. But I guess for didactic purposes, for teaching purposes, this is still nice because we can um, discuss um, many properties on this very, very simple example here. So this is, you know, see this multimodal function here. Now I'm going to place a couple of points. So for now, I'm, I'm going to focus on this area here. So I'm kind of zooming into this. Uh, so you see this here um, and I'm going to place a couple of points. Um, let's just assume that the initial points we placed were just placed in this region of interest. Okay. Um, and as I said, we now want to extract maximum information from these design points, from the data that we have gathered so far and want to kind of learn the properties of our function f and kind of get as close to it as possible. So how about we try to approximate our function f based on the data that we have. So I will simply now induce learn a regression model f hat non-linear regression model usually um, where I just use all of the data that I currently have well and then I fit my model and that model is now here uh, given as this bluish dotted line and as f here is without noise I can even fit an interpolating model instead of a true regression model so I can interpolate um, through my design points and instead of optimizing now on the very expensive f, where for each point that I want to try out, where I want to see the outcome uh, in order to drive my optimization, I simply now optimize on the surrogate, on the alternative, uh, on the cheap alternative f hat, um, where I simply have to evaluate a pr prediction in order to get a feedback value for my iterative optimization. So I will now optimize this bluish guy here, maybe by running one of these, um, one of these black box optimization algorithms that perform quite well if they're giving a high budget, which I can now afford because my surrogate model is cheap to evaluate. Uh, so I will run my optimization, for example, my evolutionary algorithm on top of that surrogate model. And I will optimize until I find the minimum of this approximating function f hat here. And this I will now propose for evaluation and evaluate. Yeah? And I will get a feedback value. I will get a true Y value, which is of course not necessarily the same as what my model predicted. So in this case here, I'm not too far off. And then I will adjust my model by, for example, refitting on the grown, by completely from scratch refitting on the grown data set or by doing something like an online, online update, which is a bit faster. Um, and then I will do exactly the same again. I will optimize my cheap surrogate model, get a new point, evaluate that on the expensive black box, adapt my function, propose a new point. And in this instance here, I'm seeing that I'm actually proposing either exactly or nearly exactly the same experiment that I've seen uh, before. So I've converged and I will not go on. Now, um, here's the um, basic loop and kind of pseudocode. I do not really think we have to go through this again a lot. So maybe let's just check that we have covered all of the notations. So we'll fit our, um, I guess even the initialization phase is, is, is missing here a little bit. Um, but um, we guess there's like a uh, stage zero. Uh, we just do some initial exploration, maybe through LHS design. Um, okay, can repair this line here in it via eg l h s m, and then I will fit my surrogate model. I've had all my available data. I will optimize that. So here I would, for example, um, optimize my. Actually, that should be minimum. Yeah, so I will um, minimize because that's my default. I will minimize my f hat. Get a new point, evaluate that, update the data, um, update the model, uh, and so on. Okay. Um, yeah, so 
fitting the model would then happen here again in um, iteration and then in new light in the new line one in this I don't know in this loop okay now more interestingly if you look at what um, happens on this multimodal function yeah if you for example take um, Actually, I think I lied in the beginning of the video, right? So um, let me check that again. So, ah, yeah, yeah, I actually lied. So um, I didn't really zoom into this area here. I actually considered the complete area. So ignore this, right? So everything else I said was correct, but I wasn't really zooming in onto this. I just placed my points here. So this it actually looked a bit misleading because um, we didn't see the uh, true function in the background. So, um, it looked to me like the function might have been unimodal, right? Um, so these were part of my initial design. And then I kind of honed in into this area here, which looked the most promising. And then I kind of converged into this. And I pretty much optimized for this local minimum here. And that's kind of nice. So I found that, I found that precisely. You can also see that in this area here, my function my surrogate model matches the underlying function quite well. What where of course failed is that unknown to me and unknown to my, I don't know, vanilla, well, not vanilla, to my, to my naive version of my Bayesian optimization, there's a second minimum here in this second even better valley, okay? The reason why I why I didn't converge to this global optimum is because I have not built anything into my optimization procedure yet to enforce exploration, to maybe place a point here or there that then give me some information that maybe something interesting is going on here and I should exploit this. Well, I worry, I should, could say also, I don't know, explore this fur further and this trade off between exploration and exploitation. Now, this is one of the most important um, yeah, trade offs, one of the most important aspects to get right, especially in black box optimization. And at the moment, we are basically only exploiting, right? If we are optimizing the prediction of our surrogate model, that will just look into areas, try to kind of fine tune in areas we've already observed very, very good function values, but we'll never explore areas that kind of um, yeah, at first glance look bad. Like for example, this area here. Um, fortunately, I have not really explained Bayesian optimization uh, completely. We are missing something, one very important ingredient, and this is a better way to propose points. Um, they are still based on our model and based on its predictions, but it does something slightly more complicated than directly accessing the prediction function as a surrogate model, and this is called constructing an acquisition function. Sometimes people also call this an infill criterion. If I would if I do what I've explained here in this session, um, this would be called um, using the mean prediction function as an uh, acquisition function. And well, as we've discussed, this results in high exploitation, but low exploration and potentially uh, carries with it the risk of premature convergence. And in the next section, we'll discuss what we usually do in Bayesian optimization, uh, what better acquisition functions are, what the expected improvement criterion is, what the lower confidence bound is, and so on.